Today is very early April 24th, 2023. I want to talk about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, and I want to start by taking a look at the map. As usual, uh, let's take a look at liveuamap.com. It is a pro-Ukrainian map, so just keep that in mind when we look at it. But uh, even according to this pro-Ukrainian map, we see uh, the report of Russian airstrikes uh, in the Kherson region. And we see continued fighting uh, outside of Donetsk city in the Donbas and uh, in the northern Donbas region, Bakhmut. We see the fighting continuing there. And we can see a very small uh, percentage of the city is still held by Ukrainian forces. And even this pro-Ukrainian map admits that there are Russian forces fighting all along this area where Ukrainian forces are clinging to. We're waiting for Ukraine to launch its counteroffensive, its big spring counteroffensive. And we continuously hear how it will be somewhere in the south, Zaporozhia, cutting the land bridge between Crimea and the rest of Russia. But there's also the possibility that it could unfold in more than one place, or it can unfold in an, in an entirely different place. We just don't know until it unfolds. One of these places could be in and around Bakhmut, a, a counteroffensive to push Russian forces out of Bakhmut. So we'll just have to wait and see. But as things stand right now, we can see Russia making steady gains in Bakhmut. The city is virtually under Russian control at the moment. What is the Western media saying about the fighting taking place in Ukraine right now as we wait for this Ukrainian spring offensive to unfold? What are they saying about the fighting? I have been talking about increasing Russian military aviation activity along the line of contact and the use of these glide bombs. And I explained how this is because uh, Ukrainian air defenses are deteriorating. What few systems they have left that are long range and able to hit uh, targets like Russian bombers, they are going to be uh, centered in cities and other priority targets. They are not going to be used for force protection along the line of contact, which allows Russian warplanes to come in with these glide bombs. These uh, warplanes and these glide bombs are released from an altitude and a distance outside the reach of most, most of what Ukraine has left in terms of air defense for force protection. Now the Western media is talking about this. So, so this is from DW, this is German media, and it says, guided bombs, new Russian tactics in the Ukraine war, question mark. It's not really a question, it's, it's absolutely happening. The article says, Russia is increasingly attacking Ukraine with guided uh, bombs, according to information by the Ukrainian Air Force. So they're citing the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian military specifically. The Russian Air Force previously only sporadically used such weapons, but in recent weeks, up to 20 guided bombs hit daily uh, were registered along the entire front line. Ukrainian authorities say the city of Kherson, which I just showed you on the map in the south, and the country's regions bordering Russia and Belarus are particularly affected. But as, as I've shown, so has Fdivka and also Bakhmut. It also says uh, the Russians are dropping more and more of these bombs because they are running out of missiles. Very few are left, so they have switched to cheap aerial bombs. And this is the spokesman for the Ukrainian Air Force. This is what they told DW. This is obviously Ukraine coping with the fact that they face yet another significant setback. These glide bombs are precision guided weapons. So they're just as precise as R Russian missiles and rockets and some, some of their artillery, but they are many times larger. The warhead is many times larger. So the destructive power is much more powerful with these, these bombs. So this is, this is not a substitute for Russian missiles and rockets. These are superior to Russian missiles and rockets. Uh, for example, the caliber cruise missile has a warhead of around 500 uh, kilograms and the Iskander missiles, it's quite a large missile, a uh, long range, 500 kilometers, has a warhead of up to 700 uh, kilograms. 
uh, these bombs that are being dropped are over a ton. Uh, the warhead is over a ton or more. Uh, so that's what we're talking about. Significantly larger explosive power, just as accurate as an Iskander missile, a uh, uh, cali caliber cruise missile, or a, a rocket from a Tornado S multiple launch rocket system. The DW article also says, by using guided bombs, Russian forces may be changing aviation tactics to mitigate the risk of further aviation losses by operating out of the range of most Ukrainian anti-aircraft and air defense systems at the cost of the ability to conduct close air support. The U.S.-based Institute for the Study of War wrote in an assessment recently. But I've, again, I've already talked about this. Uh, Ukraine's S-300 systems could possibly be placed closer to the line of contact and provide a, a certain degree of force protection, but these systems have been destroyed. The interceptors that they use have been depleted, and what few systems they have left are protecting priority targets. They are not on the front line anymore. This is what has opened the window of opportunity for Russia to use this weapon system, which is actually more powerful than systems that they have been using up until now. So it is, it is changing the game. We hear a lot about game-changing weapons that the West is supposedly supplying Ukraine, but in reality, this is how you change the game on the battlefield. Using military aviation, dropping precision-guided bombs that have a much larger destructive power than anything that has been used up until now. And then uh, even the DW article admits, it says, for the most part in Ukraine, the Russian army uses bombs that are originally unguided and weigh 500, 1,000, or 1,500 kilograms, and they date back to Soviet times. The high explosive fab type bombs are equipped with wings and a satellite control system and upgrade to a high precision weapon. So this is contradicting what the Ukrainian Air Force official said, that these are just cheap substitutes for guided missiles and rockets. They are not, they are just as precise and even more powerful. The article also says, Ukraine currently uses Soviet anti-aircraft missile systems in defense. Even if they can hardly stop aerial bombs, the anti-aircraft missile does not hit the object itself, but explodes next to it and pierces it with splinters. Uh, this usually doesn't work with a bomb. To destroy guided bombs, Ukraine needs modern air defense systems like the Patriot. Recently arrived from the US, the Netherlands, and Germany, he, he argues, uh, but there are not enough air defense systems to defend the entire front line and the borders with Russia and Belarus, experts say. They also argue it is risky to deploy them close to the front line. Russian troops will try to destroy the Patriot systems, even if just for propaganda purposes. So there's not enough of them. And even if you did have a, a few extra ones and you try to put them along the line of contact, they would become priority targets for Russia. They would be destroyed, which is what has happened to Ukraine's S-300 systems. Those were also priority targets. And they have been targeted and now they're gone. And that is what has opened the uh, window of opportunity for Russia to begin using these glide bombs. And as they diminish Ukraine's air defense systems even further, that'll open the door for an even greater use of Russian military aviation. They talk about how Ukraine needs Western warplanes and how somehow that's going to be the way they're able to deal with these glide bombs. They can send their fighters up and intercept these Russian warplanes dropping these glide bombs. But in, in reality, that is not going to happen because while Ukraine is out of air defense systems, Russia is not. They have uh, a, a very large number of very capable air defense systems. They also have the majority of their military aviation still at their disposal. So they have air defense systems that will shoot down uh, any Western uh, warplane transferred to Ukraine. They also have uh, warplanes that can intercept them. They also have cruise missiles that can hit them while they're on the ground before they even take off from whatever airfield they would be operating out of. So this is a non-solution to this problem. Now we're talking about this upcoming offensive and we continue to see stories in the Western media about Ukraine and its preparations uh, for the offensive and also how uh, Western nations are sponsoring Ukraine ahead of this offensive. We have articles like this from Ukraine Form. Ramstein countries deliver over 230 tanks to Ukraine Pentagon chief. It says now in just a few short months, the contact group, they're talking about this 
Ukraine contact group that meets every month in Rammstein, Germany. Uh, in just a few short months, the group has delivered more than 230 tanks and more than 1,550 armored vehicles and other equipment and munitions to support more than nine new armored brigades, Austin said. They're talking about U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. But just to put that into perspective, 230 tanks, most of which are not actually Western main battle tanks. This is a point Alexander Mikuris of the Duran made very recently. Ukraine started out in February 2022 with over a thousand main battle tanks of their own that they were familiar with, that they had ammunition for, that their maintenance crews were familiar with in terms of sustaining and repairing. Over a thousand. And now they're getting just something like 230 tanks. This is a fraction of what Ukraine started out with when Russia began its special military operation in February last year. A lot of the tanks that they're going to be getting are T-72s and their derivatives, uh, different variations of the T-72. And just remember, the few Western main battle tanks that they are getting uh, vary from extremely old, like the Leopard 1, to relatively newer systems, like the Leopard 2. They use different ammunition, they have different optics, they have different engines. So you've, you've got a small number of main battle tanks that Ukrainian crews are unfamiliar with, and you're also straining your logistics in the process. Here's another article talking about this contact group and the, the results from it. This is from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, U.S. government-funded media. It says, U.S. military chiefs say increasing Ukraine's air defense cap capability, most urgent critical task. Well, we were just reading a little bit about that and how uh, how this lack of air defense has opened this opportunity for uh, Russia to use its military aviation more widely and more effectively. This is what it says. It says, fortifying Ukraine's air defense capability was a major theme of a meeting on April 21st of dozens of countries that have supported Kiev in its fight against invading Russian forces and as it prepares to launch a spring counteroffensive. General Mark Milley, the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, told a news conference that beefing up Ukraine's air defense system was the critical military task right now, adding that the goal is to make sure that it has a robust and rigorous layered and high altitude to mid altitude to low altitude and from short range to mid range to long range. Well, that sounds great. What steps have they taken to do that? And the answer is nothing, nothing at the meeting. And um, this will be in the video description below to the link to this transcript from the Department of Defense, a, a press briefing after the contact group met and they talk about air defenses, how important they are, how desperately needed they are, but they mention not even a single step in regards to finding and sending more systems to Ukraine. And I've talked about this at length. Russia, China, and their allies have invested heavily in air defense over the last several decades. The US and its allies have not. They have invested in air superiority through warplanes. This is a, a capability they cannot transfer to Ukraine. Uh, their air defense systems are far behind Russia's and they have far too few of them to transfer to Ukraine. Anything that they can manage to find and send to Ukraine will be used to defend cities like Kiev, critical infrastructure, other high priority targets. They do not have enough to provide force protection along the line of contact where Ukrainian forces are now being targeted by these glide bombs. Another outcome of the contact meeting in Rammstein, Germany, was this announcement regarding M1 Abrams tanks from the United States. So we turn to the New York Times. U.S. says it will begin training Ukraine on Abrams tanks with, within weeks. Well, the, uh, the spring offensive is supposedly about to start within weeks. So you're going to start training. How long does the training take? Well, this is what the New York Times says. The 31 M1 Abrams tanks promised by Washington could reach Ukraine by fall, far sooner than expected, American officials say. Defense officials said that about 31 tanks were expected to arrive in Germany to kick off a training program for Ukrainian troops that is expected to take 10 weeks. The tanks could reach the battlefields in Ukraine by the fall, said the officials. So no, no earlier than the fall is what they actually mean. It could take much longer than that. 
uh, and they spoke on a condition of anonymity to discuss security matters. Well, the problem is 10 weeks, it's not enough training to, to get Ukrainian forces ready to operate M1 Abrams tanks effectively on the battlefield. An entry level tanker takes up to six months to learn their job. Then they go to join a tank crew with other crew members who have more experience and a tank commander that has at least several years of experience operating uh, that specific kind of tank. And there's no way to create that type of tank crew for Ukraine in this conflict. It would take years to do and they don't have years. So what they're going to do is accelerate the training, condense the training down to 10 weeks and they'll be able to drive the tank, they'll be able to, to point the gun and shoot, but they're not going to be able to use it effectively on the battlefield. And this is what they're sending Ukrainians into battle with, uh, this type of inadequate training. In that same New York Times article, I noticed this. Uh, I saw a picture of an M109 self-propelled howitzer, 155 millimeters. You can see the artillery shells in there. It's basically an artillery piece on, on tracks that can move around uh, very easily. And they say that this is in Bakhmut. And I would have thought that something like the M109 self-propelled howitzer, something like this would be essential for the offensive. You'd want to preserve advanced weapons like this for your offensive. The fact that it's in Bakhmut means one, or two, one of two things. Either it's there because they plan on launching an offensive there soon, or they have actually diverted some of their best weapons away from uh, preparations for the offensive to fight in Bakhmut. I see a lot of comments uh, where people are skeptical that an offensive is even going to take place. I agree with Alexander from the Duran that yes, indeed, uh, an offensive will take place. We have to remember last year's Ukrainian offensive launched in Kharkov and Kherson. It was supposed to be a spring to summer offensive. It ended up being launched in the fall. That's something to keep in mind. And I want to remind people about the nature of that fighting. In Kharkov, there were hardly any Russian troops there at all. And I'm going to share with you an article from the Western media about how even though there were hardly any Russian troops there, the Ukrainian forces still had a hard time pushing through that area and they still suffered a lot of losses. Then Kherson was even worse. They suffered uh, many more losses. There was no breakthrough. And the only reason Ukrainian forces reached Kherson city was because Russia made the decision to withdraw to the east bank of the Dnieper River. We are talking about between Kharkov and Kherson, we're talking about anywhere between seven to uh, 11 brigades lost of uh, men and machines. And a brigade at full strength is around 4,000 troops. That's a lot of losses for Ukraine. And uh, we have articles where they talk about this. So you have articles like this from uh, the Washington Post, and I've talked about this article many times. This is from September last year. Wounded Ukrainian soldiers reveal steep toll of Kherson offensive. And when you read this, they talk about how badly uh, outgunned and outfought the Ukrainian forces were, how uh, they were outmatched in every way by Russian forces. And Around Kherson, Russia did not create the type of defenses, nor had, nor had they committed the number of troops that they have now committed along the line of contact. Uh, in the south, around Zaporozhye and Kherson, and also in the Donbas region. But even for the Horkov offensive, we have this NPR article here, Ukraine's offensive in Kharkiv was hard and bitter say soldiers who did the fightings. We hear about this effortless sweep through, uh, seizing all of this territory from uh, Russian forces. We later find out that there were hardly any Russian forces there at all, but when you read articles like this, and the link will be in the video description below, you can see how much difficulty they had even pushing through an area relatively un un undefended by Russian forces. In the upcoming counteroffensive, that Ukraine is almost certainly going to launch. If there is somewhere along the line of contact that is as undefended as Kharkov was last year, then yes, they're going to be able to punch through and they're going to seize a significant amount of territory until they reach 
a location where there are a more significant presence of Russian soldiers. If they try to punch through defenses that are well prepared and well manned, then we're going to see fighting more like what we saw around Kherson. Uh, we hear about uh, this first 24 hours. There was a foreign policy article, a foreign policy magazine article that I cited in a previous update, and they said the first 24 hours will be crucial. They want to try to panic Russian forces uh, into disarray. And that is how they're going to punch through because they cannot actually do it with just uh, equipment and manpower alone. So there's a psychological aspect to all of this. Overall, Ukraine does not have as many uh, trained men, machines, or ammunition as Russia does. But what they are going to do uh, and what is likely is that the West will start pulling from their strategic reserves. This is something they can only afford to do one time because once those reserves are gone, then they depend entirely on monthly production, which is not a lot. They will pull from these strategic reserves. They will give Ukraine the maximum amount of uh, weapons and ammunition that they can, they can give to Ukraine. And what they will do is take that and concentrate it in one or a few places along the line of contact, uh, even though overall, they're still outgunned and outmatched by Russian forces. They hope locally they will be able to overpower Russian forces there and punch through the defense. They may, able, may be able to do that. They may be able to take territory. The problem is, as long as there isn't a complete panic and a complete disintegration of Russian forces, Russia will adapt. This, is, this has always been Ukraine's problem. They do not have the ability to overpower Russia. That is something they are incapable of doing. They're able to get these local successes, possibly, if Russia makes mistakes uh, defending certain points along the line of contact. But overall, uh, Russia will be able to reorganize, stabilize the line of contact, and then Ukraine will be exactly back where it started. Missing an army, waiting for NATO to transfer more weapons, more ammunition, and train up another army's worth of, of manpower. And this time is going to be the last time because NATO does not have the capacity to do this for another cycle, not, not as quickly as they've done before. Let's just look at it in terms of sustainability. We've talked a lot about arms and ammunition. What about manpower? I saw this video uh, by Alex from History Legends. It's called Ukraine is Running Out of Soldiers. The link to the video will be in the video description below. And he cites several articles from the Western media, including this one from the Washington Post. And it says, as spring offensive nears, Ukraine is drafting reinforcements. Now, we all remember these leaked documents that came out that supposedly say uh, Ukraine only lost something like 16 to 17,000 killed in action, which is absurd because Ukraine at one point or another had hundreds of thousands of troops in its armed forces uh, 16 to 17,000 is, is not a small number, but it's also not a very large number when you have a force as large as Ukraine had. Uh, the problem is if that those numbers were true, then you would not have to you not have to be scouring the country to find more recruits. And this is what the Washington Post says. It says the men in uniform could show up almost anywhere anytime. They knock on civilians' front doors and randomly stop them on street corners, handing out draft papers that can turn lives upside down. Ukraine needs more soldiers and fast. Kiev is preparing for an imminent assault on Russian occupying forces. And while Ukraine does not disclose its casualty counts, commanders in the field have described large losses. And everyone can see that. And we can all see that the numbers that Kiev provides when they do suggest how many soldiers they've lost, we can see that those numbers are fabrications, nowhere near uh, anything resembling reality. So they have a manpower problem in terms of quantity. They also have one in terms of quality, the training that they're receiving. These are crash courses. They're going to the UK. They're going to other countries in Europe. They're getting trained by the United States. They're getting courses that should take five to six months. They're getting this in five to six weeks. We just saw the, the tank training for the M1 Abrams, 10 weeks. It should be more than double that, just for an entry-level tanker. They're going to get half 
that amount of training, less than half of that amount of training. Uh, so they're running out of troops, and the few troops that they're able to scrape together are not getting the training that they actually need to survive on the battlefield. And then there's also the overall economic picture. And I'm not a, a financial or economic expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I saw this on Twitter. CNN, Farid Zakaria, and he's asking uh, U.S. Secretary of Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, are sanctions against Russia working? And she says, yes. And I noticed this graph as she was explaining how the, the point of the sanctions was to deny revenue to Russia. That was one of the, the goals. And they show this graph to prove that that's what the sanctions have done. And I'm always suspicious when I see a graph with so few data points, you know, from January 2022 to January 2023. And you can see, uh, has gone up and down, but they make it look as if the overall trend is down. Then if you go to this Reuters article here, which is actually from June 2022, Russian oil and fuel revenue up even as exports fall, IEA, and you look at the graph that they include, Russian oil export revenues, and it starts in January 2021 to January 2022, and you can see how low it was in 2021 and how it's been going higher and higher and higher. There are ups and downs along the whole way, but the overall trend is up. And so when we're asking if sanctions against Russia are working, we have to play games with our graphs to make it look like they are, then the answer is actually, no, they're not working. That is the actual answer there. They're not working, they haven't worked, and they don't look like they're going to be working anytime in the near future. When you look, add all of that up, it looks very bleak for Ukraine. I'm going to say again that people should not underestimate Ukraine's counteroffensive, uh, the ability for Ukrainian forces to concentrate enough firepower on one or a couple of points along the line of contact and overwhelm Russian troops locally. That is a possibility. There could be a breakthrough. There could even be a, a significant amount of territory gained. But at the end of the offensive, they're going to be right back to where they started. Russia will conserve their uh, fighting capacity. Ukraine will have exhausted theirs. And there is only a finite amount of support the West has been able to give Ukraine. And we can see that they're reaching their limits. Russia will be able to once again mitigate these short-term political losses that they surely will suffer if they lose any territory at all to Ukraine. But they have proven they have the ability to maintain this uh, long-term strategic advantage overall. Only time will tell for certain. We'll have to keep an eye out for this offensive whenever it unfolds. Uh, observe it carefully. Keep in mind that if you don't know the troop dispositions of Ukraine and Russia with certainty, then there's no way you can determine the outcome of any sort of offensive or defensive action. Just keep that in mind. We kind of have to wait and see it start to unfold at least before we can get a good idea of how it's unfolding and how it will continue to unfold. So we'll keep an eye on that. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. Uh, check the video description below for other places you can find and follow the work. In the video description below are also all of the links that I've referenced in this video as well as for ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize my YouTube channel. If an ad pops up, feel free to skip it because it's not helping me out at all. If you do want to support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee and Patreon. Uh, the links will be in the video description below. To everyone who has been helping out, whether it's through one-time donations, month-to-month -month donations, or even if you're just helping share my work with others, getting the word out there. I greatly appreciate all of that support. That is what makes this possible. So thank you again, and as always, thank you for watching.